By the way, hello, beautiful human. I'm Zach. That's Dana. We welcome to the studio. First time in a long time. Yeah, this person's been on the show before. Zachary Gordon. Yo. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I just want to say publicly for the record, when I got that text from you uh, asking me to pop on the show, such an honor, dude. I, I have loved seeing your growth, not just as a human being, but as an artist, as uh, I like to say a visionary. You've been doing this way before most people have, so I, I want to commend yeah. you, and obviously, Dan, lovely to see you, so thank you for the opportunity to You give me uh, goosebumps, hang. because I've really? really known you a long time. <laughs> Like, we've known each other, I think, it has to be 10 or 11 years. Potentially more. Yeah, it could be, right? Yeah. When did you guys yeah. meet? I mean, w diary, the first diary of a wimpy kid, right? Yeah, yeah, very, very first one. You were one of my earliest friends, too. I remember we used to go go-karting. Yeah, I remember, your mom is the sweetest, <laughs> kindest woman ever. And she says hello, by the way. I say hello right back. I mean, we hung out in New York. We've hung out in New Jersey. We, yeah, I've known you for so long. And then... I ran into you a few months ago and I w couldn't have been happier because I, I y you were always incredibly gifted and you. you'd always uh, do shit over the years. But like, I really, I remember hearing, like I kept thinking today, I was like, when did you really want to start doing music? Because it wasn't necessarily when I knew you, but like when I knew you, you were like super young. I mean, you were just like, you, you're, you were a movie star too. Which is fucking crazy. When you say things like that, it goes in one ear and out the other. One, because the life that I've always known that's normal to me is being on film sets. Yeah. Right? So it doesn't seem like this new thing that I've adopted, this movie star, whatever people want to refer to it as. I feel normal. I feel really normal. I, I grew up around public school kids. I mean, mm -hmm. you knew me when I was younger. I feel like I'm relatively the same besides maybe I've matured just a little bit more. Oh, 100%, <laughs> but you were always really normal and you always like stayed around normal kids and I didn't you go like were you still in school? Yeah, I, I attempted to stay in public school. I think filming schedule got very difficult, so I would pop in one semester, pop out another yeah. and then as you I'm sure you can imagine building friendships and relationships hard. Very, very hard. And I, when I was younger, I think that was the struggle was realizing, man, I really resent the fact that I can't I, Why well, I didn't know that I was resenting the fact that I couldn't form normal relationships, but in hindsight, now being an adult, looking back, realizing, well, that is the sacrifice that you make. A lot of people, uh, this is interesting. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Zach, and, and yours as well, Dan. As I've gotten older, I've started to realize that when people talk about being famous or rich or in, and being an influencer or an actor, an artist, um, no one talks about the cons. Everyone just talks about all the things you're going to get, right? They talk about the fame, the money, the relationships. Mm -hmm. And I was on a, a podcast months ago. I, I rarely do these, but um, I feel like someone asked me, what advice would you have for parents who want to get their children in the industry? Never been asked that in my life. And I went, wow. You know what advice I, I've, I'd give parents? One is make sure it's what they want to do and not what you want to do. And I was fortunate enough to be in a in a great situation where I had parents that supported my dream. I was the one that had to beg them, but um, I think that the parents and, and sometimes the kids, when they aren't old enough to realize what they're giving up, don't realize when you're on film sets or you're attempting to go after this dream, imagine not getting it, right? You are sacrificing the days hanging out at school, after school, before school, play dates, sleepovers, all these things. Which are like vital to growth as a human being. Very vital. And so... I, my childhood was talking with adults. That was my childhood. And the, the short form interactions I had with friends at school, I was never going to fit in because I go from talking about business and taxes and how to invest my money at a, as a 12 year old to, Hey, let's go shoot some hoops. And no one could really relate on that sense. And that was the weird struggle that I had growing up. I say weird because I didn't realize it was a blessing and a curse because no one talks about the pros and the cons. It's only usually the pros. So um, I think in hindsight, I wish I hadn't tried to blend in. I wish I'd embraced more of the, the situation that I was in, which is, yeah, I'm growing up faster. I'm around adults and I'm probably not going to relate to as many kids. But when you're in one foot in, one foot out, it's very difficult to not think that everyone is against you, right? Like, yeah. like you're the outsider. And uh, that's how it felt. And instead of embracing it, I feel like my whole life until recently, uh, I only recently started to embrace it, but um, for the longest time it was thinking that I was the problem, I was the weird one, uh, the acting was a curse, 
and I just wanted to fit in. And so whether I decided to go full force with acting, I wasn't going to fit in because I was still trying to hang out with the public school friends, which is fine. And if I was trying to hang out with the public school friends, uh, I was never going to be embraced because we related on different things. And that's OK, too. But for the longest time, it was just this battle, this struggle. And, and I empathize with my parents because they just wanted to give me the best childhood that I could have while also going after my dream. Thank God for that. But um, it was never going to happen. It was never going to be a normal childhood. And what, so, yeah. Was it worth the sacrifice? Definitely. Like I said, really, it was only until recently I realized that I'd never thought about the sacrifices, and that was why it felt difficult. If, I, if someone had came up to me and said, hey, Zach, you can be an actor and do all these films, right, or do music, et cetera, uh, but you're probably not going to be able to fit in as much. People are going to like you or hate you for no reason. It has nothing to do with you, uh, and you have to be okay with that versus this person hates me. I don't know why they hate me, so let me try to convince them to like me or this person really likes me and they don't even know me, I'm a little nervous. We haven't even really had a conversation before. And so instead of realizing that just comes with the territory, I probably would have uh, acted differently around. I, I would have just stayed myself, <laughs> which was full tangent aside. That was what ended up happening is I'm, I'm finally, I feel like, stepping into who I am and who I've always been. So, but What changes it? Like, What opens your eyes up to like realizing all of this? Ever since I was younger, I mean, you knew me uh, when I was very, very young, but I was always an old soul. Mm. I say that. Yeah, you really were, dude. Yeah, and I feel like I'm a very nostalgic person, so even as this interview is going on, my heart and my mind is reminding me that this time will soon be over. So be present, reconnect with an old friend, make new friends, and so I feel like I've always been that way, and as I've gotten older and wanted to, I feel like, connect with people that connect with the work that I've done, especially music, because that is really unapologetically my vision and who I am. And so naturally, I've started to take the time to reflect, to go, okay, well, I'm in a position where I can do things that allow me to connect with people. I walk on the street. I'm at Chipotle. This happens all the time. Shameless plug to Chipotle. But um, <laughs> every time I'm in Chipotle, I get recognized. I don't know why. It just happens. And it really it bridges the gap between I could go in, get my food, and leave, or I could have a conversation with somebody, but for whatever reason, they watched something I was in when I was younger, right? Uh -huh. And it's like a superpower. Like, I get to automatically, first off, with great power comes great responsibility in the sense that um, it shouldn't be taken for granted. It should be respected, it should be reciprocated, and it should be really appreciated. So I try to take as much time as I can with these people because let's just say I ran into, I don't know who are people from my childhood that I, we watched, Anyone from Nickelodeon, yeah. right? Like like that era. Those shows, if I met those people automatically, I feel like I know them. And so you don't want to break that bond. You don't want to take that for granted for sure. And you, you guys have been doing this for a long time too. No. People have that same bond with you whether you realize it or not. So no, it it's happens like, all the time. And yeah. it's like actually the greatest thing ever because it allows me, to, it reminds me that like what I, the sacrifices were worth it and that what we do every day and put a lot of heart and soul and energy and time into is really it matters to someone somewhere. And to your point, like it, it, somebody coming up to you and saying anything to you is a big deal and should be appreciated and respected. And that, that what they give to you should be given right back to them. Um, and I also like feel a responsibility to make sure that that moment is exactly what they wanted and more because they have this idea that's built up in their head of exactly, and we're very lucky. We don't play a character, right? Like we get to just be ourselves and maybe sometimes it's a little bit exaggerated versions of ourselves. But at the end of the day, like people, like when you watch us, when you meet us, it's the same exact fucking thing. There's no difference. But I do feel responsibility to make sure that like somebody walks away with the moment that like, you know, matches their, just matches the fact that they even said anything to begin with. You know what I'm saying? So... I get you. Totally. I very much feel you. Um, but it does take a lot of energy, and especially if it's happening numerous times a day, which we don't want to brag. Sometimes it does. Well, there are also a lot of child actors who kind of want to forget their past, and they kind of get annoyed when people say, I used to be a huge fan of yours when you were a kid. Does that ever have a weird factor? Or are you just like, as long as you're, 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 you just remember me from something? Or how do you feel about that comment? Like, I used to be a big fan of you when I was a kid. Well, Dan, you're absolutely right. I think for the longest time, I resented it yeah. because I just wanted to fit in. I just wanted people to like me for me. And it wasn't until I matured and realized this is a huge gift and a blessing. 
It allows you to connect with people you've never met before, yeah. right? It, like I said, it's a superpower. So appreciate that, recognize it, and then also realize that you have a responsibility just because you didn't take the time to reflect on the cons, mm -hmm. which I don't see as cons now, right? But especially as I'm branching out into music and, and already have people that are willing to support me, that's like... That's the hardest part. I put out my first song, and I thought no one was going to listen to it. And because of all these sacrifices I made as a child, I'm going after another dream of mine, and people are supporting that. And so, again, it's, it's one of those things where if someone recognizes me and says, hey, Greg, they don't call me Zach. <laughs> I am Greg. I'll always be yeah. Greg. And just because when I was younger, people didn't see me as Zach doesn't mean that now as an adult I can't take the time to appreciate that. And, and like you were saying, you know, I'm now at a place where I can be myself. So you guys are very fortunate. You don't have to be a personality. I I should say, I don't want to say sympathize, but a lot of the influencer friends that I think we all have, sometimes it's a personality and sometimes they get to be themselves. Yeah. But it's exhausting, always trying to chase drama. Or I'm not saying that that's all it is. It's a lot of work, a lot of respect for, for those people in that side of the industry. But now doing music people go, oh, wow, like Greg's doing music. And uh, most of the response that I've gotten from my music, which is I did not expect, I'm meeting new fans that see me as Zach, see me as more than just the films I did. And obviously I've done a lot of projects and, and movies and video games and TV shows, but I'll always be synonymous with, with Greg and grateful for that. But yeah, I understand why people would be resentful about it because sometimes you never realize what you're giving up. And it's almost like whether we talk about pros and cons of any type of career, whether you have to move for a job that pays well or move your family uh, or be an actor or be an artist. Like everyone talks about being a musician is tough today because a lot of the game is social media and TikTok, especially when you're an artist. You don't want to put yourself out in that light. But also, guess what? We live in a time where it's never been easier to reach a new audience. So right. if you don't embrace that, I'm not saying your art doesn't matter. It definitely does. But there's so many artists that... I feel like get stuck on the idea that I'm just going to make my art and people are going to come to me and maybe that will happen. But you got to be your own marketer. You got to be your own uh, influencer. And it's never been easier to reach a, a crazy amount of people. So again, the pros and cons. You feel like it's a con, but it's not a con, right? It's just a, on how you perceive it and what you're really your North Star is for goals, dreams, et cetera. I, don't, I think I feel like I rambled a bit, but I hope I no, touched on that. No, you, you definitely did. You, you, and you're 100% accurate. I, I do, you know, you're creating great record. You, you put out a great record. I haven't listened to any other music outside of Time Bomb, but it's fucking good. Thank and you. there is something to the fact that being Greg has helped you grab eyes and attention right out the gate that then propels the algorithm, that then puts you in front of new people. I mean, it is all connected in some way, shape, or form. And you waited so long before really making a pretty public splash from a totally different direction that it really has worked out to your, your, your favor. I'm assuming labels are reaching out to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, as you know, two decades of experience in the entertainment industry. And you've learned a lot from Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I mean, have you talked about, like, I feel like you got effed over in those movie deals. Is I that a crazy thing to say? <laughs> I can see the uh, the TikTok <laughs> edit right now. <laughs> Wimpy kid actor. Um, you know, I, I feel like every actor when they're young. <laughs> Zach is waiting to ask this question. <laughs> um, no, because, I, by the way, it's so funny. I look at the t one of your TikToks is like, you're, I, I guess like it's kind of a reveal. And there's like 14 or 15 million views on the thing. And it just, again, reminds me how popular Diary of a Wimpy Kid those movies really were. Yes, the books are popular, but the movies breathed a whole new life into the series in a way that like you could have never expected. Even to this day, it's difficult to comprehend because I yeah. feel very normal. I'm I am normal, right? Like I'm not different. My job is just different. And I know people say that, but I've really worked hard on trying to remain as grounded and humble as I can because I've seen what the opposite does. I've seen so many people I've grown up with go down the wrong path and that doesn't mean they're bad people even though people will perceive them as bad people it's just that it's hard there's no how to be a child actor handbook mm -hmm. you know and especially when you mess up so many people are quick to attack you which again I, I wouldn't say is necessarily the worst thing in the world it's part of the territory right the pros and cons like we were talking about earlier and so 
in a sense, um, realizing that Wimpy Kid was bigger than I felt like it was when I was younger, never felt that more acutely than right now. And TikTok and social media opened my eyes to that because when you knew me, I was just trying to fit in with people at school. And I carried that with me throughout past college, a couple of years ago, decided, hey, I want to do music. I should probably start building an audience. And then putting out videos and realizing, whoa, a lot of people are watching these. Maybe it's just the algorithm trying to keep me on the app. And then you see edits. I log on TikTok every day and there's a new edit of young me and people will send it. And me being the nostalgic person I am and loving the worlds that filmmakers and artists, um, even interviews like this can build for people. I was watching one yesterday because it just always pops up on my page and because um, I'm going to like it and support it, right? <laughs> young me. I love that nostalgia. Clearly a lot of people do as well. And to read the comments and go, oh, like Greg was always this, or Rowley was, was the one that, that really hit, had the brunt of it in the films. And what I see is I see the experience that I had growing up when I watched those, those, those clips, those edits, even the films themselves. I texted my castmate, uh, Robert, who plays Rowley, and, and Grayson, who plays Fregley. I actually make a lot of music with Grayson in Nashville. We, we fly back and forth. Um, but he's an incredible musician. But I texted them this morning, and I said, when was the last time you watched the films? I would love to watch them again. And that's because it's clear that we were a part of something that's bigger than all of us. We're just cogs in a wheel, I like to say. We were lucky. We were chosen. Right time, right age, enough talent. And, man, I'm going to watch those movies with my kids, you know, one day. <laughs> it's pretty so cool. <laughs> so are you guys going to yeah. get together and have, like, a watch party with the cast? I would love to. I would love to just from that pure nostalgia yeah. aspect because, again, when I watch things that whether I'm in them or whether they're on Netflix or uh, Amazon, et cetera, and insert streaming service here, <laughs> all I think about is I wonder what they were feeling that day. I wonder if they actually hated each other. Did they have good chemistry? Oh, I bet they were dating while they were filming that movie. <laughs> and you can see it, and it makes that relationship even more impactful. Wow, what a special thing that – all those moments, those memories where they were at in their life at that time are captured forever. And so when I think of Wimpy Kid, I think of this young 11-year-old 11, 11 who was pretty fearless. I mean, as I got older, I started to adopt a lot of insecurities that the world tends to inject into you. But when I was younger, I wasn't afraid of anything. And I feel like a lot of that is reflected in that first film, just a, a kid who was hanging out with his friends, eating candy, and <laughs> didn't realize that there was like a $20 million movie being made and, and he was the face of it. And so I think it's important to stay humble, stay grateful, and realize that the success of the film is in part of the responsibilities that we all took on and also the collaborative effort. Well, I'm rambling, trying to sound smart right now. No. Um, just in terms of it was ours, not just an individual, you know, the studio, the cast, the the costume designers. I mean, even like there's a shirt that I wear in the first film that has like a, a plug on it. And they designed that the Twisted Wizard video game that is only in the books and in the <laughs> films. They created that. I mean, this world has nothing to do with just the cast. We were at the face of it, but everyone made that what it was. And so it's important to remember that and recognize that. But does that give you perspective to maybe at the time the lack of monetary reward given to you for those movies? I would say, since I was a young actor, probably would have done it for free, yeah. right? I think anyone would have. And it was a big opportunity then. Didn't realize that it would carry over into the rest of my life. Well, yeah, but, it, and by the way, like, you know, like, obviously, you look now, it is worth it, right? Like, e even if it was for free, you are about to have a huge fucking mu music career, in my opinion. So, Thank you. Thank you. And that is in part because of those movies, whether we like it or not. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say it has not hurt. And yeah. especially now, we have a lot of musician friends seeing that I put out my first song and like by the end of this week, it'll have a million on Spotify. And it's just me, dude. I don't have a manager. I don't have a label. I'm just like out here <laughs> just trying to make the best music I can, taking a long time because I felt a responsibility to all the people that have supported me and and maybe dealing with a lot of pressure as a kid, knowing that I want my first thing to be good, to be great. And I'm proud of it. Thank you for saying that. It means a lot. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Oh, it's dude, first of all, it's all over my feed. The <laughs> hooks are really good. Like there's a there's a I mean, dude, it's a good song. 
It's a good song. Put my heart into it, man. Yeah, you can tell. And, and like, I understand, like, it's it, putting something out there like that is very hard and very different than anything else you ever fucking put out there in the world. That's right. The difference, Zach, is the fact that when I'm on a film set, I get a script, yeah. I get a call time. It's partially yours. People tell me what to do, and more often than not, I am playing somebody else. Yeah. But music is, I'm the director, I'm the writer. In a lot of ways, I'm directing the producers, I'm the singer, and I'm then the marketer, and then I'm also the person that has to tell the story. So whether that's visually, in a music video, I'm editing my lyric videos. I, I put up my lyric video after my song came out because I like didn't really know what time my song was releasing. <laughs> like It was just all these things where I'm feeling a lot of pressure because right, acting, music, marketing, voiceover, um, it's... Uh, it's it's can feel overwhelming, but I also know that this is my thing, and I want to learn as much as I can before I invite the rest of the world to help me on this journey. And that means labels, that means management. Again, I know what it takes to make it in an industry, and I want to treat music the same with the same respect that I have acting, because I know that there's a million talented musicians out there, and dare I say that talent isn't enough. It's the most important thing. But if this is what I had to learn, if you're not marketing your music, especially taking advantage of tools like insert any social media app that's out there and TikTok, right, then you're missing an opportunity, I should say. And the way I would see it is, let's just say you're going to put money into paid ads, right? Well, how many eyeballs would you get with those paid ads versus you put out a couple of Instagram, TikTok, et cetera, videos, and those are free views. So I think that's the shift that has to has to happen for maybe people who are struggling or artists who feel like they're stuck in the, the way that I don't want people to know a lot about me. And that's okay. That's a, a path that I chose for a long time. But now that I'm doing music, I know what I have to do because I've started to learn it, right? i got a lot of musician friends that um, I'm trying to learn from because they know more than me. I mean, you probably know a lot more than I do in, in terms of how to market and music, et cetera, not just from the show, but I know a lot of your friends are you know, on that same path. But to be honest, nobody them. really necessarily knows. Like, I think it's about genuine music, and I think you can look at, like, TikTok and understand the science behind it. Yes, like, every good, successful musician who's using TikTok to market, you can look and analyze the layers of every video to understand exactly how and why it works. And, by the way, tactics that you use, you know, you playing Brent Riviera, you know, your song in a car. Like, there's layers. Like, you know, where is it happening? Who's behind you? Is there an emotional connection? You know, what is the person holding? I mean, there's a thousand things that could trigger th things within a human being that would make them react to a video. But at the end of the day, there's no real one way, right? I think consistency is the most important thing. And genuine matters the most. And also, like, originality goes a long way. And specificity, if that is, if I said it correctly, <laughs> being specific and giving real detail in your song that matters too. People connect to really specific shit. And then on top of that, I think, you know, genius is in nuance and details. So paying attention to every little thing matters. But that being said, that's like a, those are, that's a loose framework that you really can't, you know what I mean? Like there's no one way to being successful, but like, I think to your point, talent is the most important thing. And then once you get to a certain point though, team does matter. But like, I, I know a lot of musicians who did it on their own and made huge, huge, huge businesses without a single record label until they needed it. Like artists that just sold their catalogs for tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars and then signed to a label. That's fucking nuts, you know? That's like a crazy, like think about that for a second. So, you know, slow and steady wins the race, but there's, eh, there's no one way. But I, I think ultimately everything goes back to the songs you put out and you're doing that. Well, I have a question for you. Yeah. You see where I'm at. You know me. Yeah. You have, a, uh, I think, an idea of the type of music that I make. Yeah, I, I'm thinking, like, very much acoustic singer-songwriter pop. Give me, like, vintage hot AC. I fuck, fuck, I fuck with it, yeah. I got to show you some more stuff. I got um, a bunch of new songs ready to go. I just got back from London a couple of days ago. And, um, so are you I, setting up your own sessions? Yeah. So you're doing everything yourself? I want to learn. I, I feel like I need to learn in order to know how to run my business. Otherwise, I, people are going to cut corners and and this is my brand right and i, I want to be able to yeah go full steam ahead the uh, right way as yeah. close to it as i can no you need to keep doing this independently that's the right thing to do dang okay well that was one thing i was gonna say you see where i'm at what advice would you have for me seeing where i'm at 
the, the path that I've taken in terms of like maybe content, maybe music, what advice, what, just a fly on the wall. You go, oh, look, look at where Zach's at right now. Maybe I'd check this out or keep doing the same thing. I think you need to bring in a strategic like partner that allows you to help act like running your business independently. I don't think you need like a label. I think you need the right partner that can help putting in the different pieces in place for you to build out what it takes to have an independent music business. But then also you need to plan follow-ups properly. And I also think you need to like focus on playlisting to support the virality that your record's getting. Like the, the like the sound's being used a lot. Like it should be in a lot more viral playlists on DSPs. Um, I also would put a remix out. I'd cut out like some of the middle parts of your song, make it a little bit shorter. Um, you want honesty, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. fucking a I'm a student all day. Here. How long's the song? I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, yeah. I love the record. It's so fucking good. I, I mean, honestly, dude, I was a little nervous when I fucking, when you were like, check out my music. Not gonna lie. Like, I was like, oh, shit, fuck, God, nah, another, per like, you know, like, you know, you, you never know. It's fucking good. <laughs> well, I have a question. Why is Time Bomb your <laughs> debut single, not Ladies in L.A.? So, Ladies in L.A. was uh, a friend of mine as a rapper. I have waited way too long to put music out. And he said, stop waiting. I wrote a song. I'm gonna rap on it. Just sing on it, please. And so, in a lot of ways, he gave me a little push. I was nervous. I didn't know what to put out. And again, a lot of these songs were not Time Bomb specifically, but I, I've had songs ready for four years. I've just been nervous, right? Because mm. I wanted to make sure that what I put out was a, a true reflection of me. So, that was, uh, I would say, like, I just was a feature on that song. I wouldn't even call it mine, really. Um, and Time Bomb was my lyrics, my story. I just got my heart shattered. <laughs> and... The way I deal with that pain, at least as I've gotten older, thankfully, is to lock myself in a room and, and talk about it, work through it. What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? What did I do right? Give myself some credit. And I feel like that record in itself is a reflection of, I think, nostalgia, right? Which is, a, a, I think, ingrained in me. Um, I'm a very emotional person. I cry out of happiness. I probably cry every day. Not in like a bad way. I just feel very deeply, right? And so a lot of that is just like, going through the stages of grief. Uh, one minute you're, you're feeling petty, the next you're heartbroken, and then you get to the heart of the matter, which is I'm still not over you, right? And it's just a, a, a big part of when I locked myself in my room after that relationship ended, I just tried to hit on all cylinders. So if you really break down those lyrics, every word that I say, I probably spent hours trying to make sure it was exactly how I was feeling in that moment including, by the way, the demo vocal. Like, it wasn't even like I cut a demo vocal, and then I tried to cut it four months later, and I realized, wow, I'm already healing, and I'm in a different place, so I, I have it to honor it. It sounded different. Yeah, yeah, very different. So but what do you, yeah, what do you take with you that you learned from making that song that you want to apply or you've been applying moving forward? Well, already I have realized that music has saved me, literally. Not in a cliche way of like, oh, life was so bad and now I'm, I'm back. Music is the way that I deal with everything now. If I'm angry about something, I pick up my guitar and I write about it. Um, I was in London and, and I had a wonderful experience out there. And so every session that I had, I was reflecting in detail about the things that had happened in my life in that moment. So that is, when you talk about specificity, that's exactly how I approach my music. It's not even a means of, I want people to listen to this. It's selfishly, if I don't say exactly how this moment happened <laughs> emotionally and pick the perfect word, word that makes me feel like it reflects exactly how I'm feeling in this moment, the song isn't done. And I have to do it in that moment because my emotions change and the moment fades. Mm. So that is my approach in every song. And sometimes I'll pick up a song and go, I should have just sang those lyrics. I wrote a whole song. I made a whole track, but I wish I just sang it when I wrote it because now I'm, I'm happy, right? Or now I'm like angry and I can't sing a happy song. So I honor the emotion, the emotional state that I'm in. I make sure to be as specific as I possibly can. And selfishly, I, I treat it as therapy. It's getting, getting it all out, getting it documented because I'm a nostalgic person. And so at the very least, I can look back and say, hey, that moment was documented in my life. Do you have a release plan, or are you just going to hold for now? I shot my album cover for my next single yesterday, so and on a bunch of the content, right? So what I learned from Time Bomb was I had an album shoot, and I didn't really have any content. <laughs> so essentially, I was just 
running a race, trying to catch up, having my producers throw toothbrushes at me in the studio, <laughs> <laughs> just but having fun with it, right? And so in hindsight, what I've learned is film the content the day you have the shoot. A lot easier, right? Yeah. Especially because I travel so much and I don't have time or someone to help me film. Uh, next song I want, I guess I'm saying this, I haven't exactly said this yet, but I want it out by the end of next month. Uh, ideally, it's done. I have other records that are done, but I feel like I didn't know which song I wanted to put out first. I really didn't think people would listen to Time Bomb immediately. This was a long-term game for me. So I was like, most people's first record doesn't get more than a couple thousand eyeballs, and then the next one does a little better and then better. So now I'm, I'm scrambling a bit, but I have my next four records essentially done. I think I'm going to keep doing singles keep building my audience, keep interacting with them, give them the time that they deserve, right? Um, and from there, I think, depending on how the next few do, uh, no pressure, I'm just going to consistently release, have an EP, and then an album, essentially. I, again, I can write, if you put me in a session every day, what I'm good at is lyrics and melodies. I could do that for days. What I'm not good at, I, I should say what I need to get better at, is building the... I have the the skeleton, and I need people to put the meat on the rest of the song. How are are you like DMing producers or people reaching out to you? People have reached out to me, and I actually like to honor the people that have I've enjoyed working with. Right, people who understand how I work, and obviously you have to give people the opportunity to figure that out as well. But like I said, the guy who plays Fregly and Wimpy Kid, I, I fly out to Nashville every couple of months. My next song that's coming out, I made with him and his, his other buddy, Luke, and we're in a garage, and it's so sick. How uh, cool is that, though? <laughs> like, what a full circle moment. Who would have thought that the two main characters of Diary of the Wimpy Kid would be like, making music together? <laughs> He's working on his album now, too. He is incredible. He's been a musician before he could walk, so a lot of people don't know that. He is incredible. We've had shows. Like, before I even had my song come out, Time Bomb, we had a gig in February, and Grayson, so Grayson Russell's his name in The Breaks, amazing bunch of guys and we had a show at a coffee house and like a couple hundred people showed up I don't even have a song out and like all these people just came to support and so the greatest feeling was wow we have people that are going to support us whether we suck or whether we're great so wouldn't it be great if we didn't suck and we actually respected the fact that it's hard to get people to show up to shows so let's be great and he is the person that has set the bar for me because not only is he an incredible leader for his band um, and they would all agree, but he respects his fans, he respects his bandmates, collaborators, rehearses more than anyone I've ever seen in my entire life. But he's also, his band is also playing, like, they have a gig at a 30,000-person show in, like, a couple of months. Like, yeah, they're they're very low-key, but they're playing these gigs, you know? They're, they're incredible. So I get to be a fly on the wall and learn from them, you know? That's what, that's what the biggest blessing is. Oh, this whole thing is very cool. I want to hear the rest of the music. You must send. I will. I definitely will. Are you kind of happy you waited? Because you said you've had music for four years ready. Are you happy you waited this long, or do you kind of wish you would have released it four years ago? I think that I could have released it years ago. Not because it was as good as the, the artist that I'm becoming now, because I'm taking the time to really cultivate the skill. But there was some charm in the fact that I didn't know what I was doing. And touching back on the nostalgia something really precious and sweet about a young guy who is talking about his heart, doesn't know exactly how to articulate it yet, and capturing that. And so I think in a lot of ways, some of those records that won't live, I wish they had lived because someone out there might resonate wherever they're at in their life. And so I think that advice for myself and maybe other artists out there, I would, I would say humbly, is don't wait for perfection. And it's not that it can't be better. It's that your version of better or perfect is different to somebody else's version of perfect or better. And a lot of the times, I didn't release records because I didn't think it was perfect enough. And my idea of what perfect was was totally wrong. It was totally wrong. And that's the only reason why I wish it was out is because you're not the only judge sometimes. And so it's great that I feel great about Time Bomb. But the best feeling is that a lot of people are resonating with it. And so... The song was ready 10 months ago, Zach. <laughs> I went back and forth changing the chorus and adding little things, which, which made great parts. But, like, now I would do things differently on that song. I'd build up the chorus more. Yeah, but that's a part of the you process. Know, like, that's okay. Exactly. And it, it is okay. Thank God I put it out. And I also think everything comes out at the right time at the, for the right reason. <laughs> and you can make the case that the algorithm wouldn't work for you in that favor 10 months ago. You never know. 
Yeah, and even when TikTok was, like, during uh, the pandemic, I feel like a lot of my stuff was doing very well and could have had a song, just just live and let people be the judge of that. And so I think, again, hindsight's twenty twenty, and I'm not angry or resentful. I'm very, very grateful. So thank you. Whoever's listening who's heard my song, thank you, because it feels like I'm finally able to do what I want to do with my life. Not that I don't love acting. I do. I'm grateful to be able to do all of it, but music's me. Uh, are there any parts that you went out for, audition for, that you wish you got that you didn't get? Because I know you, you, you've you got out for, uh, you must have got out for everything. Spider-Man. Did you go for Spider-Man? Yeah. Spider-Man. I, I still feel like I would have been a great Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. I was on the street the other day and someone's like, oh my gosh, I loved you in Spider-Man. I was just like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and hats off to Tom Holland. He works very hard. I've never met him, but I've heard wonderful things. He's a really nice guy. That's great to hear because... Uh, as I'm sh- <laughs> I mean, I don't know him. I only met him like once and I was like, hey, who are you? And he dealt with me. Oh, it dang. No, it was really embarrassing. I really should edit this out. <laughs> I'm probably going to keep it in. Um, yeah, Spider-Man would have been amazing. I just feel like I feel like I would have done well in that role. Maybe I wasn't ready for it. Maybe that's the charm of it, that I would have just been wherever I was at that time. But now, taking on that role, I feel like I would... Obviously, any any young actor would put their heart into it, ideally. And if not, get out of the way. But, yeah. How far in the process did you get? Not very far. I know they asked me to audition, and I think me and everyone else. I think everyone, everyone, I think they were auditioning 50-year-old men. Not not really. (laughs) Not really. But, um, you know, it's just one of those things where that was his role. Everything aligned for him. I, I, I don't know truly how that unfolded, but what I am aware of is he was working on a movie with Chris Hemsworth when he was up for it. Thor just come out. He, I think he either was a gymnast or did ballet. Don't quote me on that, but he was already capable of doing things that I wasn't able to do flips at that time. And now I'm doing martial arts, right? But um, back then I wasn't doing it. And so he was, he was ready and that's what the studio wanted. And, and obviously he's, I mean, the franchise is doing very well. So that's not not an easy thing to do, too. It, it's not even in his control. It's just it happens, and people either show up and support or they don't. So, is there anything you turned down? This is a sad answer or a cop out, but I don't like talking about the things that I've turned down. One out of respect for the filmmakers, and two, sometimes I don't turn those things down because I want to. It's scheduling. It's I'm up for something else. And I, I, one thing I actually could say is a great example is I was up for Wimpy Kid. I didn't even have the role but it was like a nine-month audition process. It was down to me and four other guys, and I was offered a film where I had to shave my head, play a kid with cancer. And the the producers of Wimpy Kid said, if you shave your head, you're not up for this role. We're not having you wear a wig. So I didn't have the role of Wimpy Kid. I knew in my heart that it was my role. Turned down the offer and auditioned again for Wimpy Kid. Got it. Went to my cousin's bar mitzvah. He was turning 13, (laughs) all right? I was in New York. After I had done this last audition for Wimpy Kid, and I told everyone at that table, it gives me chills, man. I said, yeah, I'm going to be Greg Heffley in Diary of Wimpy Kid. They're like, really? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the Wimpy Kid. I hadn't gotten the role. I just got off the plane and had my last audition. That was it. But, like, I knew. I just knew. I knew the whole time. Someone else was cast at one point, too, and I, like, didn't care. Like, I was like, no, I still slept with the books under my pillows. <laughs> I, I, I made a drawing after I had a callback. Like two days before my birthday or something, and I said my birthday wish is to, to be the lead in Diary of Wimpy Kid. I just, if people don't believe in manifestation, <laughs> and when I sometimes doubt myself, I just look back at younger me, uh. and the entire time, I mean nine months, I knew it. I just knew it. Imagine this: someone else is cast. <laughs> then, <laughs> I I actually was up for another TV show, and so I passed on auditioning again for Wimpy Kid, and then. That TV show didn't work out, and then I got this movie, but then Wimpy Kid now all of a sudden wanted to audition more people. And then I'm like, okay, no to the movie. I feel like Wimpy Kid is, is going to happen. And uh, it did. <laughs> and now you're here. Still going. Yeah. Listen to Zachary Gordon's music. We're going to put a link in the description below. You can listen to everything he's put out there, including that, uh, what is it, the L.A. Ladies? Ladies in L.A. Ladies in There's L.A. There's more music coming. There's more and more music Yeah, but you can follow on Amazon Music. A link is going to be in there. Are you... Are you going by Zach Gordon or Zachary Gordon? Music, I chose Zach. Okay, I think that's cooler. Yeah, I, it just feels more me. Like I'm not changing my NBA jersey, and it's not a big deal or anything. <laughs> I just feel like 
that's where I'm at right now. You know, mm. Zachary is my, my film name and, and it is my full name, but, um, I, like I was telling you, I feel like I've matured. I'm, I'm becoming more of who I feel like I've always wanted to be. And that involved a change and dropping <laughs> three letters. <laughs> big deal. You know, makes Huge. all the difference. It's, you know what? It is a big deal. Cause if I, if I heard Zachary Gordon's coming in, I would say you. And if I heard Zach Gordon, I'm like, who is it? do I know that person? Like it is just three letters, but it does make a big difference. It's true. It feels right. I only go by Zachary when somebody's yelling at me or well, angry or stern. I've or never heard anybody call you Zachary. Oh, they yeah, they do sometimes. It's my mom's my mom's go to. Zachary. You know what I thought of the other day is why is it when we impersonate our mom or our dad, it's always in like this high pitched angry <laughs> voice. Go to your room, Zachary. <laughs> like it's never like Zachary. No, it's never pleasant. <laughs> never. Uh, seriously though, listen to Zach Gordon's music. Link in the description below. I really appreciate you, man. Thanks for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Come back for album. I, I would love to. Yeah, Let's do course. it. Let's uh, do it. I do have one last question. Yeah. Please. This is good. What is Tignari? So Tainari oh, is uh, no worries, no worries. So Tainari is a character in a game called Genshin Impact. I was recently announced as the voice. They have an incredible fan base. And I'm very, very honored to take that role and bring him to life. Really a dream come true for me. I've, I've always been a huge fan of just anime, video games. I've always been in the voiceover world, but never had an opportunity to play. Oh, bubble Guppies. <laughs> yes, Bubble That's Guppies. That's fucking right, I dude. was Gil, the guy with the blue hair. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. We, worked, we were working at Nickelodeon at the same time. But we, we met before I worked at Nickelodeon. But I remember when you were working there doing fucking Bubble Guppies. <laughs> Damn. Anyway, that was to- so fun. Sorry. What a great- no, no. I'm, you're right. And and to compare those two, I would say that this game has a lar- much larger fan base. At least a yeah. fan base that's very interactive. <laughs> a little and, bit different than yeah. Bubble Guppies. Yeah. All I can say is that when that role was announced, I had a flood of people that were so kind and so supportive and so excited that I was. All these memes were being made of of Wimpy Kid and Tainari and and. I was like trending on Twitter. I was flying back from London to LA and it was like I was trending on Twitter and someone just literally just sent me memes of my Wimpy Kid character and <laughs> now my video game character outfit. It was just like and then even the author of Wimpy Kid texted me and said, "Hey, congrats on the video game. <laughs> just getting all these weird memes of my character uh it dressed up in random clothing." Sick. And I'm like, "Well, that's part of the video game." But very grateful and it's a wonderful game. Honored and I'm excited to hopefully meet more of those fans and they want to check out my music too, which a lot of them have. Has been really, really grateful for that. What so. does he sound like? <laughs> hey, Tainari here. So he sort of just sounds like this, but he also um he's a little nerdy. So you have a little bit of a like you you put the resonance in your nose because he's a botanist. So he takes after the people in in the area that he lives. <laughs> well, how do pretty you, fucking? Sick. How do you find that voice? Well, what's interesting is, well, yeah, <laughs> well, wh- 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 whether you're um, whether you're live action, voiceover, etc., you get an, a, a character description, and then you do your interpretation of that. So I think when I auditioned for him originally, my audition was probably just more so Zach, like more excited and more more rasp in my voice. This seems to be a lot of the voice that I do for a lot of my voiceovers, you know, stuff like that. And so when I eventually got the role, I worked with the voice director, and uh, Chris is his name, wonderful guy, and he said, you know, I, I feel like we should, we should make this our own a little bit more, and so we went in this direction where, because Tainari is essentially, he's a genius, but he's also very thoughtful and very caring, and not to say that typically uh, people who are very smart sound nasally, but we thought, hey, it's it's a video game, let's let's pick a trait that might make him, I don't want to say more unique, but make it bring him to life. Uh-huh. And that's what we settled on. It took a couple of, of recording sessions to hone it in, as anything would, right? You know, you you have to practice and get better at it. But I'm very proud of the direction that we went in. And, and again, like, so much fun bringing that guy to life. And, again, the the, the response has been I'm, – I'm very nervous whenever I, I – as everyone here is aware, sometimes when you can – join any type of project especially one that's been going on for a long time it doesn't just come with positivity there can be course, backlash yeah. and and whatnot and so I was ready for whatever was going to come I just knew that this big fan of this world I, I 
anime has always been just my older brothers instilled that into me when I was younger. I love the values and the life lessons that a lot of these these uh, comics, uh, I should say manga, um, or manga, teach and instill, when, especially when I was younger, to work hard and just believe in yourself. Um, that's at the core of a lot of them. I can't speak for all of them. Anyway, that being said, a lot of this world has tremendously talented voiceover actors, the Genshin world. And so I feel like now that I'm a part of this cast in this game, I've, I'm finally accepted in this crowd <laughs> of, of, well, I, hopefully, ideally. And, and I'm very respectful of that, too. Because, again, that nostalgia aspect of whether people are watching Wimpy Kid or how most people would freak out when they meet, maybe, insert, huge actor here, Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, etc., Denzel Washington. I'm that way with people that brought anime to life. Yeah. Like, it's... That was my youth. That's wh how my brothers and I bonded. We would talk about Naruto and, and all these other interesting anime shows. And so now the fact that a lot of these fans are now fans of my music and supporting me and taking the time to, to, to follow me and reach out to me and, and defend me too is, is surreal, right? So it just goes back to that same tangent of the situation that we are all in is we're so lucky, so full, lucky. Full circle. Zach Gordon's music. Link in the description below. Are you good? Yeah, I got the biggest crush on some girl who loves anime, so I'm trying to learn. I'm going to dive in head deep. Who? Head first. Head deep. What's that playing? <laughs> head first. Dive who's, in head first. Who's the girl? Don't worry about it. It's between me and her. I thought you have a girlfriend. Don't worry about it. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. I hope everything works out, and I uh, <laughs> hope that she also appreciates the fact that you're willing to take the time to, to dive into her world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, dive in head first, right? I think that's what I said. <laughs> Zach Gordon, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you so brother. much. Thank you.